everyone. Hello, Jose. Hello. Uh, thank you, Tyler, for starting the recording. Tyler, will you also, uh, well, no, we'll leave it like this. Thank you. Okay, I'm showing 245. So good afternoon and welcome to Advancing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Instruction as a Core Requirement in Public Service Education. I am Vicki Tyler Carnegie, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. I am the Graduate Program Director for the Master of Public Administration Program and a lecturer at Old Dominion University, Strong College of Business School of Public Service. I hold a Juris Doctorate degree from Florida A&M University College of Law and an interdisciplinary PhD in Public Affairs from the University of Central Florida. My areas of research are social equity and public administration, as well as education and public policy. My teaching and research are informed by my previous professional work in child safety and welfare and teaching in a Title I elementary school. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our panel and my highly esteemed colleagues. First, Dr. Megan Jordan. Dr. Jordan is an associate professor at Old Dominion University School of Public Service. Her areas of research are state and local budgeting and revenue policy, financial transparency and equity in budgeting. Her areas of consulting and teaching include performance budgeting, strategic planning and ethics. Thank you, Dr. Jordan for participating on the panel today. Next, we have Dr. Ron Carley. Dr. Carley is a clinical assistant professor at Old Dominion University, where he teaches graduate courses in public administration. He holds a BA from the University of Montevallo, Alabama, and MA in urban studies from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and a DPA from George Mason University. His teaching and research are informed by his previous professional work as the city manager of Charlotte, North Carolina, county manager of Arlington, Virginia, director of health and human services in Arlington, Virginia, chief operating officer of the International City County Management Associations, or ICMA. Dr. Carley was an adjunct professor in the George Washington University Trachtenberg School of Public Administration and Public Policy for 19 years. He is a fellow in the National Academy of Public Administration. In 2021, Dr. Carley developed a new course entitled Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which is now a required course for all students in the Master of Public Administration program at ODU. This course complements the elective that he also developed on the history of race and in government institutions. The workshop versions of his equity work have been pre presented across the country to government officials, nonprofit organizations, and professional associations. Thank you, Dr. Carley, for participating on this panel today. For our session agenda, we will begin, begin with an introduction to our research by Dr. Jordan, and then I will follow that with our literature review, which involves a synthesis of critical race theory and cultural competency frameworks. Then Dr. Carley will provide a detailed analysis of our core curriculum course 
Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or PADM 736. And then we will close with lessons learned and recommendations prior to opening for Q&A. So now I will turn you over to Dr. Jordan, who will provide you with an overview of our study. Thank you, Vicki. Um, essentially, as the senior faculty member of this, this uh, dream team of people, two, two of my favorite people in the program to work with, uh, I came up with this and then went to them and said, hey, you teach the course and you're the NPA director. And I basically um, left a lot of the work to them. But uh, I noticed in previous meetings and panels uh, about social equity, um, especially last year, that our, that our core DEI course in the NPA program was pretty unique and um, perhaps ahead of the curve. And I, I wanted us to discuss the course in the context of the field and, um, and given the current needs of the public sector managers. And so the effective public uh, sector must facilitate relationships between government and the public, but do so uh, in a way that reflects cultural diversity of their community. So in other words, public managers must face the reality of today. Um, and I was looking at the census, uh, the diversity index, which is the, you know, it's an interesting index. It's the chance that two people chosen at random in the United States would be from different racial or ethnic groups. And that index has increased to 61.1%. Uh, in 2020, uh, up from 54.9% in 2010. Uh, the white non-Hispanic population is uh, estimated at 57.8, uh, which is down from 63.7. So as we already know, uh, we're a more uh, diverse society. And awareness of the change in demographics that's taking place in this country and cause for equity that, that we've had in the last few years that have been um, a lot louder um, have led to some, what I consider fear-based uh, government reactions. According to the National Conference of State Legislators, in, um, NCSL, um, and this information is you know, as of May of this year, so it may change, but in, in 2021, in 2022, at least 14 states have enacted legislation to limit the teaching or prohibit the teaching of divisive, you know, divisive concepts uh, or, or critical race theory in public schools and or higher education institutions. Uh, six additional states have created some additional limitations via administrative actions, including uh, where we are located in Virginia, the governor of uh, Youngkin issuing an executive order uh, this year, at least 24 states in 2022 have pending or failed legislation prohibiting or limiting um, divisive concepts of critical race theory. So, of course, all of this institutional attention and response to CRT uh, actually, ironically, proved the accuracy of critical race theory. Um, institution use formal and informal mechanisms to perpetuate racial disparities. And the view of the white majority is, is already institutionalized um, as laws, policies, practices, as well as the dominant narrative. Um, and the timing of all this government institutional focus on squashing the, this you know, scary rise or false rise of critical race theory is aligned with increased awareness of changing demographics and demand for social equity. Um, there is also an increased interest and in, in, in call for revitalized equity as a pillar in public administration. So as many of us are aware of in, in 68, there was the mental book conference that said we needed to, uh, that public administrators had the responsibility to support uh, equity and it explicitly um, 
stated that we are obligated to address those issues, uh, enhance those efforts and remove systematic uh, barriers. Yet equity did not um, become a stronghold in the field as a core topic, especially in research, um, as you would expect. And in more recent years, uh, especially with the 50th anniversary of the Middlebrook, there's been additional calls um, to you know, revitalize the efforts of uh, equity as a, as a normative pillar of public administration. So practitioners are challenged to execute public policy with efficiency, economy, and equity. And MPA programs are challenged to prepare them. So after decades of it being a lesser um, focused pillar, we synthesized the concept of critical race theory and cultural competency to bolster um, the efforts to incorporate it in, in uh, our curriculum. Um, the synthesis of these frameworks are useful for building DEI into the MPA curriculum and they, because they both have taken on the normative view that there has to be active actions. That, you know, it's not about speaking, it's about doing. So given that, I'll turn it over to Vicki for our literature review. Great, and thank you. Um, that was a great overview, which does um, lead us into the literature, which frames our examination of our case study. Uh, we began by exploring critical race theory as a framework. And I am sure um, most here are, are deeply familiar with critical race theory. But to give context for our study, I just want to reiterate the core pil pillars that we utilize in our research. So CRT looks at our laws and our systems of laws that have been created for where we can see a systematic bias. The framework was first advanced by legal scholar Derek Bell in the 1970s, when he, he looked around at society and he saw that African-Americans were still struggling despite the advances of the civil rights movement within the 60s and the 70s. Despite all of the laws that were generated to try to create more equal spaces and to promote equality and equity in housing, in education, in hiring, and, and even in transportation, there were still these glaring disparities. And so seeing this, he did what all good social scientists and scholars do. He, he asked why. And the resulting answers make up the core pillars of CRT. Um, first, we recognize the centrality of race. We have to come to an understanding and acknowledgement from our associations and our institutions that race and racism are American ideals, um, which have become cornerstones in the way that we picture or even view our society. Second, CRT challenges that dominant ideology that we have this colorblind, race-neutral society. This doesn't really exist in American culture. In fact, um, for some, the notion of color is um, not being seen is, is baffling. I remember I was an undergraduate at a predominantly white institution. And there was a common refrain among my friends, like, oh, Vicki, when I think about you or when we talk or when I look at you, I don't even think about you being Black. I don't even see you being Black. And my, my thought and my response was, how could you not? It's, 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 so, it's, kinda, it's kinda obvious, right? And so we like to talk about the scales of justice being blind, but CRT pushes the narrative that maybe we need to look at that just a little bit more and that maybe we're maintaining the status quo of inequality by keeping this veneer of neutrality and colorblindness. So third, CRT looks to the centrality of experiential knowledge. Well, they're basically honoring the voices of those who, who tell a different story than the dominant paradigm and looking at why that story is important to be told. 
and how we can use the voices of other people groups to ex examine our policies and our procedures for bias. So CRT also takes an interdisciplinary perspective where you look through the lens of multiple perceptions to have a contemporary context for public policy. You can look to social work, to education, to sociology, psychology, um, marketing, and various other disciplines to explore oppression. And then finally, CRT advances that there needs to be a commitment to social justice, where we work to eliminate all forms of subjugation of all people groups, and that we work for basically a unified experience as people, as human beings. But what does that really look like in application? How would a classroom applying CRT tenants actually function? Well, first, it is imperative that students understand the purpose of critical theories, such as critical race theory. There is a great deal of hysteria, hysteria and what I call mindlessness about the existence of critical theories. The purpose of critical theories is to examine social conditions, to bring hidden structures to light, and to give voice to the marginalized so that society can progress. Second, a CRT classroom will feature culturally responsive teaching that recognizes the lived experience as knowledge, encourages self-awareness and exploration, and employs empathetic listening. A key element of CRT would be a focus on community and building relationships. And finally, upon um, the classroom would promote adv advocacy and stress the importance of speaking one's own truth to power. And I, I think it is important to note here that in encouraging this, um, the potential adverse consequences of doing so should also be addressed in instruction. So after exploring CRT, our group, we looked at uh, cultural competency overall, and then explored uh, three cultural competency frameworks. The core pillars we established from various definitions of cultural competency was the development of knowledge, skills, attitudes, behaviors, and values, um, looking at recognizing that it's important that cultural competency is known and understood as a developmental process. Um, one is culturally um, constantly involving in terms of cultural competency. You don't take one or two classes and then you're culturally competent. Instead, it, it's a matter of being exposed, exposure, time, and practice, and it's a continual evolution. Um, there are specific policies and um, professional practices, which refers to the need to have, as Dr. Jordan pointed out, established plans and actions. Uh, one cannot simply voice a commitment to social justice and equity, but concrete measures need to be put in place. Essentially, we, we treasure what we can measure. And then we look to having effective service to diverse populations. It is not just the provision of services which is needed, it is the provision of effective services. Services which can effectuate change and that are delivered to individuals regardless of age, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or even cognitive abilities. But again, when we, we look at the pillars, we ask, what does that look like in application? How would a classroom applying these culturally competent tenants actually function? And what, what would someone who's looking outside, what would they see if they were seeing this in operation? Well, you would see a recognition of culturally diverse populations. And also you would see what um, Gupta um, talked about in terms of, you would see a mosaic treatment um, toward cultural competency. Uh, before the United States was called a, a melting pot, 
but in a culturally competent classroom, you will see more of a mosaic with each individual piece still maintaining its individuality while contributing to the beauty of the whole. The culturally competent classroom will encourage that self-awareness and self-exploration. It would promote communication and dialogue as well as in that uh, communication and uh, dialogue includes being technology savvy as being competent in that area increases the ability to effectively communicate through the use of um, various tools. And the culturally competent classroom will be team and project-based learning because focus is again on that communication and on building relationships and community. So there were three culturally competent frameworks we explored. We explored the 4E model for cultural competence as espoused by uh, Winters, where she calls it a journey towards inclusion, where there is exposure and increased contact with difference. There is experience that is that you create transformative experiences to build relationships and share meaning. There's, of course, education, where you're developing those new skills, knowledge, and ways of thinking. And there is effectiveness, where you're, again, you're measuring the impact of the combination of exposure, experience, and education on individuals and on an organization. We also looked at four approaches to cultural competency um, that are based on um, college um, learning styles, where there's concrete experience, uh, where the student is uh, involved in new experiences and interaction. Observation and reflection, where the student gets to watch others or develop um, observations through their obs um, developing observations about their own experience from observing others. Abstract conceptualization, where you start to create theories to explain those observations. And then there's active experimentation, where we start to use those theories to solve problems and make decisions. Now, the framework for cultural competency curriculum in public affairs was um, espoused by Carvizales in 2010, where he talked about there needing, it needing to be knowledge-based, where you look at definitions, demographics, social disparities, and policies. Attitude-based, where you look at self-reflection, you examine societal bias, culture, and change. Skills base, where you um, again look at communication, and that also um, includes that being technology savvy, looking at um, making sure your technology, um, you are efficient with technology, and also being community um, based, where you look to public involvement and um, participation. So after exploring critical race theory, cultural competency, some of the primary frameworks, and contemplating what these would look like in application, we look to synthesize the core components as to what would need to be included in effective DEI training. And we established the following synthesized framework. Um, it needs to confront dominant paradigms, um, and it can do that by promoting that self-awareness, um, have that mosaic treatment where you learn about different populations and celebrate them, where you honor the lived experience as knowledge. That includes relationship building with um, strong elements of communication and dialogue, and that it also uh, promotes advocacy and through that um, demonstrated commitment to social um, progress. Now, I will now give way to Dr. Carley to discuss in detail um, ODU's case study of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a core requirement in a public service education. Thank you, Dr. Carnegie and Dr. Jordan. It is uh, such an honor to work with both of them. They have uh, been real mentors to me on my own journey to understand these issues. And that last slide uh, by Dr. Carnegie is, I, I think, quite brilliant. Uh, she truly brought order out of what was a chaos of brainstormed ideas on how to approach this, uh, approach this issue. 
So in the spring of 2021, we collectively decided as a faculty that we wanted to focus a course on DE&I, uh, various faculty included in other courses, as Dr. Jordan will share with you uh, momentarily, but we wanted to have a course that was really focused on it, and, and we wanted to make it required. And so that's a, that is an initial, we'll go back one, yeah, that's, an, that's a problem uh, for, you know, uh, for a core curriculum, there's a lot of competition to have the core courses. Fortunately, we found one we thought we could do without. It had sort of lost, lost its focus, and it was a second uh, semester of administrative theory, and we concluded that it was really important uh, to substitute the DEI course. So we're very rapidly, we developed a prototype for the fall of 2021. That was really hard to do. Uh, based on student feedback and experiences, we developed a 1.0 version of it in the spring, and uh, simultaneously we've been developing the 2.0 version that we'll launch in the fall. If you go to the next slide, you can see how we tried really hard with intentionality to root this course in public administration, looking at PA in two dimensions public management being how you actually run public organizations. Now, this would be connected with uh, human resources or organizational theory, but specifically through, a D, through DE and I concepts. Then the other side is public policy. What are the laws and, and policies and how do we deliver services in a way that is supportive of the values embedded in DE and I? Now, obviously, either of these could be an entire course in itself. And we've had to make some really hard decisions about uh, what to put in this course to give sufficient exposure that all of our MPA students would have, recognizing that one course is not going to meet all of the needs. If you look at the next slide, you'll see how we begin to take these ideas and lay them out. So first of all, we look at the public administration structure in the United States. Now, policy is literally anything government does or does not do, and it comes in many different forms, as you can see in the, on the left-hand side of this slide. And what makes it really complicated in this country is that it operates at a federal level at 50 states and at you know, tens of thousands of local governments and authorities and commissions and everything. So it's a very complicated structure, and we want our students to understand how DEI is not just one layer of government, but it's all layer of governments from laws and constitutions to decisions that are made by the person sitting at the counter in the local government. In the second slide, you can see how we begin to flesh out the DEI framing within this public administration structure. Uh, we decided to look at various policy areas, which you can see on the left. This is not exhaustive. In fact, I did a presentation earlier this week. Uh, putting uh, DEI through a transportation policy framework. Uh, but the ones you see here are, are, are recurring themes. And then we look across seven different populations. The one thing Dr. Jordan said at the very beginning is that we have to address the issue of intersectionality. And we've tried to do that with uh, great intentionality. By starting by, uh, with women, intersectionality becomes critical. And as we wrap up uh, on disability and LGBTQ, uh, intersectional intersectionality becomes uh, unavoidable. But you can see that once we take the policy areas and the different populations, and you layer that on top of the way that policies are done, and how policy is created across the three levels of government and the, ver and the many iterations of that, it's an extremely complex system. And if inequity or discrimination or inequality gets built in systemically, it becomes really hard to dismantle it. And that complexity is part of what we want our students to understand. Next slide. So the way we structure it is a three-part course. Uh, part one looks at DE&I largely from the public management perspective. Now, those of you who are practitioners, if you have been through any DE&I training or implicit bias training or any of that, that's basically what we're doing in this first section. We're trying to give our students the kind of uh, knowledge and skills and abilities that they would typically get through practitioner DE&I or implicit bias or similar training. And you can see the topics that are in the blue box there that are very typical. Uh, we then transition using Mary Frances Winter's four E's and we use an updated version of them where she uh, morphed from effectiveness as the fourth E to empathy 
to enable us to look at our seven different groups and the impact of public policy on them. Next slide. So we have our seven groups and we, uh, as much as we can, we try to set, uh, establish a template for looking at each of the groups. Uh, what are critical terminologies around the different groups? What are the actual demographics? And this is where we really begin to understand that all of these groups to a certain extent are social constructions and they certainly are not homogeneous and there is vast diversity. Uh, however, we define different populations within our, within our, within our communities. And then we look uh, historically at what are the major public policies that affect the different groups, once again, through uh, a lens of intersectionality as well. Next slide. So uh, in looking at the public policies, as I said, we try to take a historical perspective so that people can understand how we got to where we are today. Uh, this quote from Tennessee Coates really struck with me. I'm not a history kind of guy. In fact, I sort of resisted history as much as I resisted math at different times in my life. <laughs> and, and I've learned that both of them have been to you know my my own my own peril. And and it wasn't until I really started learning the studying the history of, of race and culture and public administration that I began to understand why we have the problems that we have today. So as an illustration on the next slide, you can see how we approach the module on African-Americans. Now we have a whole course on this as well, uh, but in, uh, in, in this context, we look at basically three critical time periods of public policy, or roughly 250 years of slavery, uh, followed by the almost a century of Jim Crow segregation, and for only the last 14% last of our history has it been actually illegal to discriminate against African-Americans. But of course, that has morphed into the period of mass incarceration and colorblind racism. Uh, between the eras, we look at civil war and reconstruction and then the civil rights movement. So that's the frame. Uh, it's, it's different for each group, but we try to provide a historical framework of how policy has morphed and evolved uh, over the history of our country. Next slide, please. Uh, we uh, use uh, content from a lot of different sources. We try to use uh, uh, source documents and commentary as much as we can, especially statutes and court cases. There is an overwhelming amount of material and, and so curating material for this course that is, that is timely and that is based on source documentation. Uh, is a challenge not in its absence, but in the abundance that we have. And there's some great interactive material out there. I just put up here one of my favorite. Uh, you can Google this, Mapping Inequality, if you've not seen it. A coalition of universities have pulled together the detailed original documents from the redlining across the CDs that are shown in that map. You can drill down and get really granular information that helps us understand why we have segregated communities today. Next slide. Uh, part three uh, is, I would say, is, is the one that is uh, most in evolution. And this is where we try to take that, that fundamental material in part one and then looking at policies in part two and think about, well, what is the role of public administrators in leading diversity, equity, and inclusion and social justice? And how do you actually do that? Uh, and in this part, we were looking at leading practices and looking at uh, case studies in the fall, in, in the spring semester, uh, we had uh, two chief equity officers from two local governments come in and talk about what they're doing and how they're doing it and their challenges, trying to bring that practitioner approach into going forward. Next slide. So how have we done so far? We collect a lot of data. So we have two classes now, about 45 uh, uh, students uh, combined. This first question is from a student survey that the university conduct, conducts. It's a generic survey that uh, is applied to all courses uh, at ODU. And you can see here that we're getting very positive response on uh, the course, uh, teaching people to think critically. And the response rate on this, by the way, is roughly 90% uh, for both classes. Next slide is uh, whether or not they've benefited from the class. And you can see this is uh, very high. 
There are a couple of strongly disagrees here. Those were from the spring class, not the fall class. And I will tell you, I had one person in the third week of class tell me that I was approaching this completely wrong and tell me I, how I should redo the entire course and sort of maintain that approach throughout the semester. So that was not a, a significant surprise. Next slide is where we go into some more granular information. So this is based on an anonymous survey that we conduct just for this class itself, looking at uh, content of this class specifically, and it helps us uh, uh, grow and evolve uh, and adapt the class. And so here we look at what our learning objectives are, the ability to, to lead a multicultural organization, and we got literally 100% positive response there. The next one is applying an equity lens prospectively and retrospectively and amazingly 100% there. The next one is applying ethical criteria for making decisions and analyzing ethical dilemmas uh, and exploring the impacts of race on disparity and disproportionality in the US, uh, very close to 100% there. Again, a couple of students uh, who had issues with the class or on that strongly disagree in there. And then the last one is applying ethical criteria uh, to identify and mitigate intentional and unintentional biases. In the final slide, we look at uh, uh, some additional information. This first one is only from the fall class because frankly, uh, I've not had an opportunity to code the responses from the spring class. And uh, we really need to recode the ones from the fall as well. This is an open-ended question. What are the most important things that you learn? And some of the students really write a pretty massive paragraph talking about all the different things that they learned. But it is interesting that self-awareness ended up being the most common response. And we do place a very strong emphasis on self-awareness in this course. Uh, and empathy, and one of the one of the remarks one of the students made during uh, fall course, I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, we were having an open conversation. They said, "You know, I, I, I saw this term uh, gender queer, and I had no idea what that was. What in the world is gender queer?" And that's that has come up on a lot of uh, a lot of the terminology in DE and I from different students. And then she said, "I started studying it." And what I learned is gender queer is my son. And I never knew what my son was. And all this time, I've been thinking my son was gay and telling he is gay. And he was saying, mother, no, I'm not gay. And she said, well, I, and now I know he's gender queer. And we can have a conversation about that. And I can understand that. And that's the kind of uh, 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 opportunities we want to present to have people challenge their own ideas and notions of what we've learned over the years, the, the way we've been socially constructed ourselves so that we can see the perspectives of other people. And there have been a number of breakthroughs like that from the students in the class. I think I have, what, one more, uh, two more slides here. And so we do struggle with how to uh, teach our classes. Uh, dear, we, we've been online for a long time at ODU, so COVID-19 really wasn't much of a disruption for us in that regard. Although ironically, uh, the spring of 2020 was the first time I had two live classes in forever. And then what did we do? We had to pivot and go online. Uh, but what, what, what we've been doing in this class is teaching it asynchronously, which is what we do with most of our uh, uh, master's classes, not our PhD, but our master's classes. But we offer an optional Zoom class once a week so that we can connect and bring people in and engage them. And the Zoom class is recorded, so students who just cannot attend a live class can go back and watch it. And in both of the, both of the semesters we've offered this course, uh, overwhelmingly the students think that for them, uh, this is the, the best approach. Although certainly some would like to be live face-to-face -face and some would be, like to be, well, only one said asynchronous only, leave me alone, just let me do my stuff and uh, get out of here. Uh, but most of the students I found really want engagement. They want to connect with one another. And what has been really powerful in these classes is the peer learning. We have a very diverse student population at ODU uh, in terms of backgrounds and age and, and, um, and based on the demographics. And I learn a tremendous amount from them and they learn a tremendous amount from each other. So what are some of our lessons learned real quickly? 
uh, wrapping up my part and handing it over to uh, Dr. Jordan is that you, you just you can't do it all and, and making decisions about what you're going to cover and not going to cover is probably the, the hardest thing to do. And in making those decisions, uh, making sure you curate the content so that the students hear diverse and authentic voices. I feel a complete, uh, a, a very strong um, uh, obligation to do that as a white male myself. In fact, the first surprise people get in this class is that's taught by a white male. Uh, and I have to be very conscious of that. So they're not learning and hearing from people that look, look and sound like me. They're, looking, they're learning from people that look and sound uh, like the students that are in the class. I mentioned the student that didn't like the course very much. Uh, you're go we're gonna get some pushback. Uh, in other courses I've taught on this subject, they've been electives and I've tended to get people who wanted to be there and cared about the topic. Now that we're getting all students coming through here and we're going to have some people that are going to challenge us. And so I, I yeah, here's some recommendations that uh, we suggest to you. And besides making sure there's the diversity of content, I think is living the values as a professor and really being able to demonstrate that all the students feel a sense of belonging in the class and the students feel that a sense of empathy and caring for who they are. So let me turn it back over to Dr. Jordan and have her wrap it up with some of the other things that we're doing. All right, thank you. I wanted to mention that we have a couple of electives that we uh, are beginning to teach pretty regularly. The first one I want to mention is the one that's on the right, actually. Uh, it started in 2014 and is taught about once a year, averaging about 25 students. And I have the learning outcomes there for you. But the course focuses on you know, growing challenges and opportunities created uh, in, in the world today and you know, dealing with the misunderstandings and conflicts that are rooted in differences. And um, the course explores the structure and dynamics of all forms of diversity. So they deal with uh, cultural competent leaders at leadership. Um, this particular course is, is an elective that has been around for a while and is pretty popular. Um, and then we have Ron's course elective, History of Race and Government Institutions. And the course examines the history of uh, the US history through a racial lens in the context of public administration of policies, laws, court actions, federal, state, and local levels. Um, and it goes through the various transactional periods in, in history. And you see the learning objectives there. And these two courses uh, have been, um, you know, become a regular part of our elective rotation. Uh, they are pretty well received. Again, as he mentioned, you know, people sign up for the electives just because they are interested in being there. Uh, next slide. One thing that we also um, have is that. If you're interested in taking DEI principles throughout the curriculum, it's a good start to take an inventory of DEI principles uh, that are or could be incorporated into other areas of your curriculum. And so we actually have an inventory created by uh, our colleague, who's actually, I believe, um, in the audience with us, Marina Satzelina, um, of what is going on in our courses as that it can be DEI. Uh, how is DEI represented in our other courses? And while we incorporate them uh, in the curriculum, we do so with various tools and, and the various tools that you use normally in classes, case studies, um, intentionality of, uh, of putting in your assignment that they need to address certain things if it's relevant for that course. Um, for instance, in public budgeting, I now ask that they address inclusive public participation, uh, in the public uh, budgeting proposal, as well as DEI considerations. Um, so by having it throughout the course, it is a good way of you know, making sure we're properly preparing our public and nonprofit managers. It's not either or, the additional courses reinforce the equity uh, principles as a PA killer. Um, and I think that's all we have for today and we have plenty of time for questions. 
and comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, how are you doing, everyone? Uh, this is an exciting topic to me. Uh, I, I put a I put a question uh, in the chat, uh, and my curiosity is why they don't teach uh, in the public administration or DEI if they're talking about racism and exclusion. Why they don't talk about or teach uh, the 1638 edict on doctrine of uh, exclusion uh, by the uh, Maryland Colony. Uh, a group uh, <clears throat> council of 1638. Uh, this policy, which exists today, is underlined in the public in public government's uh, policy through law enforcement, employment, uh, jobs, and, and 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 the breakup between entertainment and business. Uh, the the thing is, is that this here certified race in the cornerstone of the building blocks of America. Now. I, as a Black African American, uh, I have to say I agree with Dr. Carney, and, and and I also agree with Dr. Carney on his statement of that what government wants to do is going to be policy, and that is true. Uh, and 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 as a policy writer myself for banks and stuff, uh, and also as a lifetime member of AFRA since 1980, uh, I I grew I went to all white colleges. And, and I had the same kickback that Ms. Connie had. Hey, I'm the only black in there. And I went with uh, executive at the time I went to school in the 70s. I went to school with top executives from the CIA and everybody like that. The thing is, is that it seems to be a very touchy, even today, a very touchy topic when you talk about diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And, 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 and Dr. Bell, back with Thurgood Marshall, and Dr. William Wilson, uh, uh, with his uh, theory of spatial mission act, they try to bring together this, but I, I still want to know why we don't teach that in the beginning, because that sets, for me, the tone that brought about the racial slave codes after that. You know, slavery came out, then the slave codes came out, then you had the white supremacy, Ku Klux Klan, and, and then you have everything else out. You had you had discrimination with red line since 19, 1917. So uh, uh, I took the law side of public administration, and that's what my PhD is in, and my master's. Uh, I took the law side because policy is essential in, in, in terms of really getting things done. And we need to teach, you know, I like to give to uh, the future uh, 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 leaders of America the idea that, hey, it's a touchy section, excuse me, it's a touchy subject. And, 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 and like you, Dr. Carly, yes, you walk into the classroom, I got a white guy teaching about slavery and stuff. But I was told that, hey, and this goes for all the Black African Americans, we call it that. You need somebody who's in charge, like Dr. Carly, his color, that thinks like you, understands what you're doing to get help support you, get you where you're going. And I hope, I, I hope that, you know, I, I don't teach, maybe I like to, but I do it from a financial perspective. I do affordable housing. I'm an acquisition funder, and that's what my company is all about. I have to help homeless, the veterans, and the low income, and that's what I write about, redlining. I just want to know how you guys want to implement that into the system, because everybody skips that, that little thing. It's 1690, then slavery. But no one talks about how, how these laws got there. But the 1638 tells you exactly what it did. And I'll read it real quick and then I'll be finished and I don't have to speak anymore. The Maryland Council certified this and they said neither the existing black population, the descendants nor any other blacks should be permitted to enjoy the fruits of white society. The doctrine was written to ensure that blacks will remain a subordinate, non-competitive and non-compensated workforce. 
Then slave codes came. And this serve, and we still, we still don't recognize it because our, our police force uses that. That's what cops were for. Cops was on patrol. They came and hunt down slaves. They still do that today. They, they, they shoot black men like it's nothing. Black women too. And, 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 and women, whether they're white or black, it's just the same problem. But my thing is that we want to teach really, really public policy and administration. Let's put it all in. It's a touchy subject, but guys, if, if we don't do it, then it'll never be solved. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. You know, one of the things I, I've learned in doing this work is that I need to be prepared to learn something new every day. And I pretty much do. So I'm not actually familiar with the Maryland Edict, but I will be tomorrow. And it may be in the course tomorrow because there's no reason not to use it. I will tell you that... Uh, we, my, my approach has been very Virginia centric. Uh, and so we do, and because we are the home of 1619, that's where people came. Uh, and so what, what we do is look at the evolution of the racialization of our populations in Virginia being a Virginia institution. And you can, some of the things that you just described in the Maryland edict, you can see in the Virginia statutes as well, because when these you know, 20 or 30 people arrived in 1619, we had no laws to deal with that. We had to make it up. And the only way we could make it up that the uh, founding fathers from Virginia could rationalize was by racializing it. And, and, and you know, Virginia, Virginia gets the credit of a lot of good things in the formulation of this country and needs to understand that we did a lot in terms of racializing our country and providing, establishing the foundations that have left us in the mess we're in today. Before, before, before you go, Dr. Carl, you're absolutely right, Virginia, in the 1619. But we all must remember that between 1492 and 1916, there was a mingle of all races that came from all parts. And you know what? They made money. They, 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 they even married. I mean, it was no problem, but all of a sudden, after 1619, something happened. And then appeared 1638 and said, hey guys, we can't have this. It became, it became racism became a color issue. Yes. And we and it and it became chattel, okay? And and it became uh as 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 I think the boys said, it became a uh, it's an economic issue. Matter of fact, uh, 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 Doctor uh, uh, Claude Anderson said it became an economic a socioeconomic system, and from that point on, that particular law was written in every new state that came into America, and 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 my only issue, my only pain is that. We skip over it, you know, like, like, hey guys, we're gonna teach you this or this, that's a little too sensitive, so we're gonna skip over it and, and we'll start with, with slavery. Hey guys, the crux of the problem is to get to it, get to the, the crux of the problem is to learn what exactly happened. I deal like the legal side because it, it shows me, hey guys, we got an issue, talk about it. Thank you, sorry, sorry for taking the time. Yeah. Well, it, it, it is important uh, that, that once you become aware of it, then it can definitely be added to the curriculum. So as long as we keep mentioning it, it I think more and more people will add it. Uh, do we have other questions about people, uh, from people about how, uh, our, you know, core course or adding DI to the curriculum? Uh, no, this is, this is really great. Um, I, I'm so glad that I'm able to sit in um, in, in this panel. Um, incredible work you guys are doing at Old Dominion University. I wish I had this, you know, when I was in college. Unfortunately, I didn't. Uh, but I think it's, it's interesting to hear um, you talk about how you are really focusing on advancing DEI, you know, as a core requirement in public um, service education, which I think should be a broader conversation in um, schools in the US, right? Um, and I wouldn't want this to be focused on historical black colleges, you know, but I wonder if there has been any conversation to push this core curriculum you have that obviously has been very successful in your school to other schools and colleges across the US, because we need to bring to the forefront this issue of DEI 
you know, across all the schools in, in the US. You know, a, a lot of schools might be open, a lot of schools might not, but at least it's worth trying to make sure that at least we centralize um, the concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion as core requirement for most of the programs across US schools, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. Well, that's where um, basically the idea came from is that in, in the last year or so, I noticed that many uh, programs of public administration, public policy, were talking about incorporating DEI principles into the curriculum more. And so as they were discussing it, I realized that we were already doing it. Mm -hmm. And, and so we, that's why I wanted us to put out something that explains how we went through that process and how it's going. So I, I do believe that it's going to continue to grow as more uh, uh, as the resistance grows. I think a lot of us realize education needs to as mm -hmm. well, because we have to deal with reality. The numbers aren't going to disappear just because you don't like them. Absolutely. And I do I do agree that the problem we're having today in today's America with this issue of DEI, and sometimes I pinch myself, I said, why are we talking about these things in these times? Like, we should know better. But I'm realizing that a lot of folks who assume leadership positions, you know, in corporate entities, in nonprofit organizations, lack the basic concept of DEI. So bringing it to the forefront, you know, in, in public schools and, you know, Stop talking about it, even from grade schools to college level, even grad school level, would kind of change the way we see leadership. So the idea of DEI should be a part of every leadership curriculum, right? You assuming a, a certain position, you know that this should be one of the issues in the front line in trying to, as you're trying to create, you know, your capacity or build your leadership team, that this is something that should be a priority, not necessarily when whenever we have a major you know, event in the US, you know, we talk about it and then it goes away. A colleague of mine once said that America is a very, is a short, uh, short memory country in the sense that things happen and then we talk about it today and tomorrow everybody forgets. You know, the issue of the uh, people still talking about <laughs> because of current <clears throat> social issues going on, but we want this conversation to continue to be in the front line of every issue we tackle, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. For me, as someone who is aspiring to get into nonprofit leadership. Uh, before, before you talk, <clears throat> Dr. George, I got one thing. Uh, I live in Texas now, I'm a New Yorker, but I've been here since 79. Banning books and talking about not teaching CRT, how, do our, our professors and everything get around it? Because CRT has been out here since uh, Dr. Bell in 1967, you know, really 87, but really 67 with Craig Marshall and before that. But my thing is how, I live in a yeah. state now where, hey guys, they can almost arrest you if you want to do something right. like this. So how you get around that? Yeah, and, and we, were, we, we fully expected that question. Uh, Ron, you want to start it? Well, I, I've got to, since this is being recorded, I have to be careful not to be a smart mouth. Um, and, and and so the our governor, which in executive order one, basically banned CRT and divisive teaching uh, in, um, in elementary school, largely in high school. And so what, what I did was I brought executive order one into the classroom. That is his public policy. And as public administrators, they need to know what public policy is. And this is the governor's public policy. And then I set up a simulation exercise where a teacher in a high school was teaching, was accused of teaching CRT. A complaint was made to the principal. The principal took it to the Board of Education. And the Board of Education had to decide whether or not it was CRT or not was it a violation of the executive order and what you do about the teacher? And the students play the role of members of, of the school board. And they had that discussion and had to make that decision. And so, the, you know, we're trying to make it real and we're also going to be turning to the pumpkins in 102, 101 seconds. So I'm gonna shut up and turn it back to Dr. Jordan, and Dr. Carnegie. Uh, just quickly about that. Uh, one thing that we have to do is remember that we're approaching this uh, with from the point of view of what managers are going to face in the workplace. 
uh, we're public administrators and we're preparing professionals in the field. And we're dealing with reality of what's out there, not what you necessarily have dreams of. And so we are trying to have that approach. So we're not trying to force you to think anything. We're trying to prepare you to deal with your, uh, your, your, um, the reality that you're going to face in the workplace. Vicki? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I just want to thank both of you all. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us. It's been a wonderful conversation, great questions. And, and I'm sure the conversation, just as we um, try to evolve and be more culturally confident, um, continues and evolves. So again, thank you. And I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you all for being great. Appreciate it. <laughs>